Hello and welcome back. This is the week eight lecture. So today we start on our third unit, the American Renaissance. So we will be doing that. We are talking about Nathaniel Hawthorne and some of the short stories by him that I posted in this week's module. But I also want to look back to the 1820s and kind of finish the work that we were doing last week when we were talking about that second generation of American writers, a group that had sort of been born in the late 1700s, right around the time of independence, and they were really coming of age. Their careers were taking off in the 1820s. So we talked about Catherine Maria Sedgwick. Obviously, we covered Hope Leslie last week, and we also mentioned James Fenimore Cooper, who we are not reading, but I did talk about The Last of the Mohicans as another example of the frontier romance. So we see that genre in Hope Leslie as well, another popular genre of early American literature. So we've covered several of those. We've talked about the sentimental novel, we talked about the gothic romance, and then last week we covered the frontier romance. So I want to go back to the 1820s and take a look at another important writer who belong to that sort of second generation, that second wave of American writers uh, that started to push things a little bit more forward uh, in the 1820s and beyond. So I mentioned him briefly last week, but I want to get in to some of his work this week. So Washington Irving is the other author that we're going to be covering in addition to Hawthorne. So Irving is kind of taking us back to the early 1820s, and we're going to discuss his important role in the popularization of American literature. He's really the first truly popular American author, both domestically and abroad. He can be argued, it often is argued, that he's the first American writer who really exports American writing, American literature. He becomes popular in other countries, <laughs> something that had been very elusive uh, for earlier American authors. So Irving plays a really important historical and cultural role, and I think a testament to his importance in our larger culture is really found in our selection from him this week. We're reading The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and even if you've never actually read his story, you're probably familiar with that narrative. It's been remade, it's been reimagined in a lot of different ways over the years. There was a pretty well-known film version starring Johnny Depp that was directed by Tim Burton, came out like 20 years ago. There was a Disney version that was pretty popular decades ago. So this is a familiar story. Uh, we still tell the story, even if we've often forgotten some of the original details <laughs> from Irving. But much like The Legend of Rip Van Winkle, the other uh, fictional work from Irving that's probably best remembered, those, those are his probably, probably his most uh, celebrated, most popular two stories, this one and Rip Van Winkle, they live on uh, in our popular imagination, even if we sometimes maybe forget where they came from. We might not think very much about Washington Irving himself, but some of his stories have lived on. So he's important. I want to start with him. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Sleepy Hollow. And then I want to transition into the American Renaissance and Hawthorne, because Hawthorne really is our first figure, our first writer from the era that's often referred to as the American Renaissance. So we really won't get to that stuff until part two of this lecture, and here in part one, we'll just cover Irving and the legend of Sleepy Hollow. So again, let's go back to a few things that we were talking about last week, as we were discussing Sedgwick and Cooper, and you know, I mentioned that they're two of the first really important and popular American novelists. Uh, they're really kicking off that frontier romance genre. They didn't necessarily create it. Uh, it had already existed in some other sort of older forms in England. There was an old English writer, he's actually from Scotland, a British writer, I guess, uh, Sir, uh, uh, Sir Walter Scott. 
who wrote what we would kind of consider to be historical fiction. Like uh, you might know some of his work. He did Ivanhoe. He did uh, Rob Roy. So he was tapping into older Scottish and English history, like from the Middle Ages and previous eras. And he was creating these sort of epic sweeping novels that were largely centered around adventure um, but they were also kind of stories of colonization <laughs> to a certain extent. Like Ivanhoe was about the Norman conquest of England back in the 10 hundreds or whatever. And Rob Roy is about these like, you know, the Highland Scots. Think Braveheart. If you've, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar subject matter. Highland Scots resisting, you know, the British Empire, resisting English colonization. Uh, so we can see how novels like that were very interesting influential to some of our early frontier romance novelists. So Scott was writing in the early 1800s, and Cooper was a big fan. Sedgwick certainly read him as well. So they're taking a lot of his techniques, you know, tapping into history, telling stories about colonial conflict and warfare. But of course, they're changing the setting. They're making it all about American history, American mythology, American conflicts, American wars, Native American history, all that stuff that we were talking about last week in relation to Hope Leslie. So the frontier romance starts to flourish, and we start to have a bunch of novels written in that genre by Cooper, by Sedgwick, and a host of imitators and other writers. So that becomes popular over the course of the 1820s and beyond. And meanwhile, Irving is also doing some interesting stuff. Irving, though, is kind of hard to categorize. He's hard to talk about in certain ways. He's a very important figure, an interesting guy, but he's not a member of the American Renaissance. Again, he belongs to the second generation of American writers, like Sedgwick, like Irving, but unlike them, he's not a novelist. Uh, he did write fiction, but he's really a more general, all-purpose man of letters. I mentioned that term back when we were talking about Charles Broughton Brown, and it also refers to uh, Irving. He wrote history, he wrote biographies, he wrote a lot of interesting travel literature, sort of like travelogues, almost like sort of journalistic pieces, essays, a lot of nonfiction. But he also wrote some short stories. He would freq uh, frequently refer to them as sketches. But we typically now regard him as one of the first real practitioners in America of the short story. That's an interesting thing to note about Irving. He stopped writing fiction as his career progressed. He kind of lost interest in it. I don't know if I mentioned that the same thing happened with Charles Broughton Brown. Brown didn't live nearly as long as Irving, but Brown also just stopped writing fiction. He actually never finished one of his novels, Wieland. He had a whole sequel lined up, a whole part two that he never embarked on. He just abandoned fiction, and Irving kind of did the same. Later in life, Irving was a lot more focused on writing history. He had this huge multi-volume history of George Washington. He was really interested in documenting American history, revolutionary history. So that was where most of his focus was later in his career. But he, he was writing up until the 1850s. So he had a really long career. He's active from the 1820s uh, up through the 1850s. So uh, he kind of persists throughout several different phases and developments. But he doesn't fully belong to any of them. Because, again, he only wrote literature sometimes. He only wrote fiction sometimes. And a lot of it got written early in his career. But we need to think about Irving also just as an important sort of historical figure. Because, like I said, he becomes popular in England and France. And he's really the first American writer to be read uh, consistently and taken seriously overseas uh, you know, by these more established, older literary cultures. So you might remember back at the beginning of Unit 2, I mentioned that quote that I think I put into the syllabus, into our course schedule inside the syllabus from that British critic named Sidney Smith, who's wondering aloud in a very facetious manner who in the four corners of the globe reads an American book. And he said that in 1820, I think, or at least it was sometime in the 
1820s. And the irony is, right as he's making that joke about the fact that nobody outside of the U.S. or even in the U.S. would want to read an American book, right as he's saying that, Irving is starting to get popular and Irving is starting to sort of be the response to that joke as really our first export, our first literary export. Uh, so Irving was born in the 1780s in New York City. So he's really born, I think, during the revolution or maybe right after it ends. So very typical of that second generation, like Sedgwick, like Cooper. They're all kind of born at the end of the 1700s. So they don't have a memory of our colonial past. They were born either during the revolution or right before it, right after it. So they're really growing up along with the young nation. But like Cooper and like Sedgwick, he's really interested in older American history. And if you remember last week, we were talking about different regions of the U.S. and how they were developing in different ways over the course of the early 1800s. And that was something that was interesting to Sedgwick as a native of New England, as a native of Massachusetts. She was very interested in old Puritan history. You know, the Puritan history of New England, the history of Puritan and Native American conflict, uh, like the Pequot War, which gets uh, portrayed in, this, in the book. So we talked about, you know, how New England, uh, that particular region had a history and a mythology and sort of a culture all its own. And then other regions of the country had different histories. Uh, they were settled by different groups of Europeans, often English, but not necessarily Puritans. So if you went to the mid-Atlantic states, uh, Maryland, you know, Pennsylvania, they had a different culture. Uh, they had some different groups. They had different events in their histories, uh, different mythologies, different legends in the South. Again, different cultures, different ways of speaking, different foods, different music. And of course, we take all that stuff for granted now, although a lot of uh, social scientists are showing us that a lot of regional distinctions are starting to go away in America because people move around so much. Uh, you know, travel is a lot easier than it used to be. The world is kind of shrinking, but whatever. We all know certain regional traits, like whether it be different regional accents or, you know, different foods, different aspects of, you know, culture, different customs, uh, different populations, you know, different groups of people based on region. That's all pretty familiar to us as Americans, as modern Americans. But it was real grist for early fiction. It was really good material for early American literature because, again, this was a way that we could differentiate ourselves from Europeans and these older literary cultures that we obviously descended from, but we were trying to do some, some new things. So Sedgwick could write about old New England history, those old Puritan Native American wars, and that's very unique to that particular place and that particular time. Now, Irving, and, and we mentioned Cooper as well, doing something similar in upstate New York, exploring the French-Indian War, you know, exploring a particular aspect of America's colonial past that's pretty rooted in, a, in that region, upstate New York, not far from Canada. So Irving, writing around the same time, actually a little bit earlier than Cooper and Sedgwick, he's doing something very similar as well, and we see it in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So like I said, Irving's from New York City, and some of you might know this aspect of American colonial history. New York City and some of its surrounding areas were initially settled by the Dutch, uh, and the English took control of that region from the Dutch I think in the late 1600s, I should have looked that up. I'm not a historian. I want to say 1660s, the English took control of what had previously been known as New Amsterdam, New York City. They took control of uh, the city and some of the other surrounding areas and what we would now think of as like upstate New York, getting up close to Albany, uh, the capital of New York, kind of going up the Hudson River. I don't know if any of you have been to New York or if you're familiar with the geography, but you can just take a look at a map. Just Google it, look at a map, and you can kind of see 
some of the areas that Irving is describing here in the Hudson River Valley. I think we're on the eastern side of the Hudson River. Not that far nowadays, not that far from New York City, but back then... Uh, when you would have had to have taken a horse and buggy to get from one place to the next, pretty distant in terms of culture and way of life, much like what we saw in Edgar Huntley. Geographically, you know, Norwalk isn't that far from Philadelphia, but it feels like a whole different world because it's very rural, it's very isolated, and we're still largely an agrarian nation. At that time, of course, I mean, Brown's exploring colonial history in Pennsylvania, right? So he's also invested in this same kind of project. Uh, but he's also going back in time, as does Irving. So Irving's going back to an era uh, in the Hudson River Valley, sort of not long after the Revolution. So he's writing this around 1820. But like these other writers, he's setting the action in a slightly earlier period. He's going back a few decades. Uh, and he's exploring a very distinctively Dutch part of New York. Uh, and again, rooted in real history, rooted in real immigration patterns. So uh, Irving himself was not Dutch. He did not come from a Dutch family, but he was pretty familiar with this history. The Dutch were there before the English. The Dutch were the first Europeans to colonize what is now New York City and many other parts of of the state of New York. Uh, so they entered into Native American conflict. They took a lot of the land away from the local Native American groups. And then later the English came and there was conflict between the English and the Dutch. The English eventually emerged victorious and the English took control. But a lot of the Dutch state, a lot of the uh, settlers, a lot of those old Dutch settlers stayed behind even though they had lost political control uh, they lost militarily, but we sort of talked about this with the French Indian War in relation to Cooper. That's the backdrop for the last of the Mohicans. And I mentioned that that war was when the French really lost their territorial holdings in the future U.S. And the English really consolidated their control, <laughs> at least for a short while before the American Revolution broke out. Uh, but again, a lot of the French settlers stayed. A lot of the descendants of the original French settlers in places like New Orleans, other parts of the South, the upper Midwest, uh, New England, even upstate New York, a lot of them stayed behind. And the same is true of the Dutch. They were not all expelled just because the Dutch lost uh, sort of colonial control or imperial control of that particular area. So there's a real Dutch heritage in this part of New York. And even to this day, you can go to these areas, you can go to New York City even, or parts of upstate New York, and you'll notice that there are place names and even a lot of people's last names continue to be Dutch <laughs> uh, because there's just always been a presence of Dutch people or people who are descendant from those early Dutch settlers. This is a very old history. I mean, the Dutch were there, have been there since the 1600s. And Irving wants to go back to sort of a, a, a post-revolutionary era. Um, but again, sort of visiting this unique region with a unique history and mythology all of its, uh, all its own. It's distinctive not only from Europe, but it's distinctive from other American regions. Again, based on the groups that immigrated there, uh, their own local history, and they have their own superstitions, right? As we learn in this story, it's very much a story about legend, superstition, mythology. And even though Irving is having fun sort of uh, pulling the curtain back a little bit and maybe exposing the falsehoods at the core of a lot of those myths, he's also pointing out that this is a sort of rural, culturally distinct place where legends and mythology can really take root. They, they really grow and flourish in places like this, uh, in places like Sleepy Hollow, because they remain sort of in this older time. This is a really important concept for Irving, this tension between progress and tradition. Also tension between urban life and rural life. So again, we're in this sleepy village, not too far from New York City, but very far in terms of culture, in terms of everyday life, the pace of life. 
So he's really interested in exploring sort of how uh, cultures interact, how culture changes, and also how American culture was changing throughout the early 1800s. We've talked about some of these aspects of modernity that are really taking place and and sort of, you know, uh, exploding between the era of Cabeza de Vaca in the 1500s and now, you know, where we are now around 1820. In that roughly 300-year period, you know, we have all of these changes. The Protestant Reformation, the printing press is still fairly new, which makes, you know, publishing much easier. Literacy explodes. Later we have, uh, you know, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution. All of these things are changing. I mean, the entire, you know, world, really, certainly the Western world, but they're also changing the U.S. So we're rapidly seeing, you know, uh, new technology. Uh, you know, again, industrialization is playing a big role in a lot of these changes. So when we first became an independent nation, we're a very agrarian nation. Most people still live on farms. Most people still make their living through agriculture. And sure, we had cities. New York City, like where Irving was from, Philadelphia, where Brown was from. But we didn't have a lot of really big cities and a lot of people, most people still lived in rural environments. But over time, that would change. As more and more factories got built, new jobs, people would leave the countryside and move to the city. Uh, Even Charles Broughton Brown comments about that back in the 1790s. He has a book called Arthur Mervyn about a farm boy moving to Philadelphia and sort of falling in with this disreputable crowd and getting into some trouble. Uh, So that's that's been happening, right? And Irving's also interested in this tension between modernization, industrialization, the rise of cities on one hand, and then these older, more traditional ways of life, these rural, agrarian, pastoral ways of life on the other hand. So again, it's like tradition versus progress. And this story exemplifies sort of how that conflict often plays out. So yes, it's a fun, sort of spooky, but also comical story. So we should definitely appreciate it for its entertainment value. Uh, But also Irving is making some larger statements about America, what was happening in America during the 1820s. And he's also sort of interested in just the story of our melting pot history, right? This is a Dutch area that's hanging on to a lot of its old Dutch traditions, but we get a sense that that can't last forever, right? They're not always going to be able to remain separate from the main currents of American life. In American life during this time, it's all about progress, expansion, growth, acquisition, They're not necessarily bad things. It depends on how we look at them. It depends on our perspective. But they do often disrupt tradition. And they turn peaceful Dutch countrysides into bustling suburbs of New York City, which is what a lot of this area is now, although you can still find some farmland. And certainly if you go further up into upstate New York, much of New York is still kind of rural. But you have to get a little further away from the city. A lot of this old Dutch territory that Irving writes about now, you know, a lot of those would be sort of like bedroom communities <laughs> for New York. But uh, again, this is an, an, an earlier era, and Irving wants to go back even further than the 1820s. He wants to explore sort of an earlier past. He's mining the, the local history, the local mythology to create something distinctly. American. It's it's native to this particular people in this particular region. But also, as we're seeing, that's just one piece of America, right? America is a collection of different peoples, different regions, different cultures. And they're all kind of getting combined in weird, often sort of chaotic ways. And Irving wants to document a little bit of that as well. Uh, Eventually, this Dutch enclave, it's going to have to get assimilated into mainstream American life. So we might view that as a tragedy. We might view that as just a necessary byproduct of progress and modernity. But we certainly have to think about it. 
So just let's just back up and talk a little bit more about Irving's career, and then we'll jump into the story in earnest. Um, so like I said, he kind of breaks through with the publication of a text called The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, which was published serially in a couple of different like volumes over the course of 1819 and 1820. And within that particular collection, we find Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So again, some of Irving's most beloved fiction was written pretty early in his career. Uh, we're not going to read anything else from that collection, but I just want to mention a, a, a key component of Irving's style and a really big part of virtually all of his fiction, at least the fiction that we remember and still read, uh, and almost everything that was contained in his collections. He had, he, you know, he would publish some of this stuff individually, but then he had larger collections of his fictional sketches, the sketchbook being the first, and then a couple of years later, he had one called Bracebridge Hall, which came out in 1822, and I'm pretty sure that's the one that contained Dolf Heiliger, the other text I posted uh, for this week. But one thing that he does in both of those collections and most of his short fiction uh, is he uh, has a narrator named Jeffrey Crayon. It's really kind of a literary persona that he created, this sort of genteel, almost aristocratic sort of guy from New York City uh, who's very cultured and sophisticated. And he's ostensibly our narrator. But what generally happens in these, in these stories is Crayon discovers some manuscript or some old papers left behind, usually by another literary persona created by Irving named Diedrich Knickerbocker. <laughs> these are, of course, completely fictional creations. But Knickerbocker is supposed to be a representative of, like, old Dutch New York. So if you guys are sports fans, you might know the NBA team, the New York Knicks. And the Knicks is an abbreviation of Knickerbocker, which is some kind of uh, Dutch thing that I don't really know anything about. But that's the origin of the team name. Uh, so Diedrich Knickerbocker is supposed to be like a historian, a Dutch historian of old New York. And Crayon is always stumbling upon these manuscripts or these papers written by Knickerbocker, which usually document some fantastical legend or story from old Dutch New York. And then Crayon presents Knickerbocker's work to the audience. So, as you can probably tell, Irving is a bit playful, and he likes to have these various narrative frames which really is meaningful if we're thinking about narrative point of view. One of the most important sort of literary elements that I hope you guys learned about back in like 203 or some previous class, but stuff like plot, characterization, uh, and narrative point of view are all very important if we're talking about novels or short stories. So we're always getting these stories at like a second or third hand remove. So Crayon's telling the story, but really it's Knickerbocker's story. And then oftentimes Knickerbocker is relating events that were told to him by some other storyteller. So Sleepy Hollow isn't quite that complex, but if you look at Dolph Heiliger, Dolph Heiliger, the other text I posted, you'll notice that what I'm talking about. So in that particular story, again, it's a manuscript left behind by Knickerbocker, discovered by Jeffrey Crayon. But the story as told by Knickerbocker is actually largely a story told to Knickerbocker by this other guy named Vandemore. And within the story that Vandemore is telling, which is the story of Dolph, our protagonist, within that story is another story told by another character related to that character by an old Dutch poet who's, you know, long since dead. So there's just all these different levels and all these different frames. And some of it's meant to be sort of comic. It's almost meant to be intentionally a little bit ridiculous. And we're not really intent, we're not meant to take all of it as being truthful. Because one thing that Irving's interested in is how legends and stories get passed down, how they get transmitted and communicated and how they change and how maybe little kernels of truth 
that were originally there, they might get distorted or they might get altered in interesting ways. And, the, and he's, he has a whole host of storytellers within a lot of his within a lot of his sketches and again even with sleepy hollow we're supposed to sort of take that story as being related to us by crayon but again if you look at the beginning of it uh in, in the version that i posted i think it does say well i thought it did on page one now i can't oh yeah this was found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker. So, again, that's always the conceit that Irving works with, uh, at least often, with his early fiction. This idea that Crayon's presenting it, but it's actually uh, a, a document written by this old Dutch historian. So we're getting it at a second or third hand Removed. So there's always questions about how reliable our narrators are. There's always questions about the, the truth behind a lot of these legends, a lot of these stories, this local sort of folklore that Irving is very interested in, the old Dutch folklore of this corner of New York. And again, Irving grew up listening to a lot of these stories. He didn't necessarily belong to that old Dutch culture himself, but he was familiar with it. He knew a lot of people who grew up uh, in those sort of uh, Dutch households. He was familiar with some of the folklore. He was familiar with the history. So he used that for a lot of his fiction, and that's you know some of the stuff that we still enjoy reading today. So again, using real American history, but also showing that we have a mythology and a unique culture, a lot of different unique regional cultures, all our own. This very, you know, very different from what we would find in other places. But also we'll notice that this story is a ghost story. And it establishes a lot of tropes that are still pretty common in a lot of ghost stories today. But we should notice that it's meant largely to be comical. Um, there are some moments that I think are, you know, we're supposed to be a little spooked. But by and large, this is a comedy. And Irving often worked in this register. Kind of a lightly comedic, satirical tone. Kind of making fun of a lot of his characters. But maybe not in a mean-spirited way. Also celebrating this unique Dutch heritage. But having fun with the nature of storytelling. The nature of narration. What can we believe? How how do things become exaggerated or distorted over time? So we should notice that as well, because that's typical of a lot of Irving's work. But like I said, later on, he kind of abandons fiction and focuses more on history and biography. And he kind of falls out of the literary scene. And by the time the American Renaissance gets moving, Irving isn't really producing literature anymore. So even though he's still around, uh, he's kind of outside that mainstream of literary production later on. But just thinking about his life, you know, he's interesting also because he lives abroad for much of his adult life. He spends his early life in New York City, but in the 1820s, or actually in the 18 teens, I should say, he decides that he wants to make a living as a writer, and he kind of surveys the scene in America and decides that he has a better chance of succeeding in England if he wants to pursue a literary career. So he moves to England, and that's where he's living when he publishes the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon and Bracebridge Hall. And when he starts to become popular, he's in England. So he has a lot of English friends. He knows English writers. Um, he's getting reviewed over there. His stuff is getting published over there and that's a big part of how we're able to grow our literary marketplace and our literary culture because Irving is again sort of our first literary export and he's treated a little bit like a novelty in England because they're sort of hey look it's an American writer uh, an American writer who's actually good and we, we don't have to accept that evaluation. We, we've probably enjoyed some of these earlier figures. But we do need to remember that even though they're very important in our own literary history, Charles Broughton Brown, uh, Freneau, Brackenridge, they weren't very popular during their lifetimes. Hannah Webster Foster sold more copies of her books, but she often published anonymously. 
as I mentioned. And even Susanna Rousen, who wrote Charlotte Temple, our first bestseller back in the 1790s, she never really got famous as a writer. She did a lot of other things, but her writing career, though she was successful, she was never necessarily famous herself. And again, there's some debate as to whether or not we can even claim her <laughs> uh, since she was born in England. But Irving lives for a good while in England. He later comes back to the States, but then later in life he served as a diplomat in Spain. So he lives for a long time overseas in Europe. So as a result, he's exposed to a lot of European literary culture. And later, he even begins to write a lot about stuff that he sees and participates in in both England and Spain. But he does come back to the U.S. and he writes a really interesting sort of travelogue about a trip he takes to the American West. Like in the 1830s, maybe. He goes to like Oklahoma and Texas. So he does a lot of interesting stuff. But again, for our purposes, we really only need to concern ourselves with some of his early fiction. But again, to return to something I mentioned before, we should appreciate him as an early practitioner of the short story. So we may have mentioned the short story's history before. I don't think so. We talked about the novel's history and how the novel really develops over the course of the 18th century. Well, the short story is an even newer literary form, and it really develops over the course of the early 19th century, the early 1800s, where we are right now. So we wouldn't say that Irving is the first uh, to write short stories. In fact, Walter Scott over in Great Britain, he was doing some short fiction as well. Some other European writers were producing short fiction, but in the 1820s, the short story had not really become standardized yet. It wasn't a clearly defined literary form. So if you take a look at these two texts by Irving uh, that we're looking at this week, they're, they're both kind of, I would argue, long short stories. Like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is definitely a short story. It's kind of a lengthy short story, but I think it fits comfortably within the confines of what we now think of as a short story. Now, Dolf Heiliger is a little bit longer, so some people might argue that it's a novella. Uh, I would still claim that it's just a long short story, like kind of at the top end of possible short story length. Um, but Irving is producing short fiction during a time when it wasn't super common. And again, he called a lot of his short stories sketches, and sometimes that was a term applied to something shorter than a novel, often what we would think of as a short story that just sort of tried to, you know, paint one particular scene or sort of create a little brief impression about a particular time and place. So it was, you know, stuff like that was getting produced, but Irving is pretty innovative. He pushes the short story forward. And a decade later, as we're going to see in the 1830s, Hawthorne comes along and he's writing short stories. And Edgar Allan Poe is writing short stories by the 1830s. And they're really the ones who help to popularize it and really help to standardize it as a really essential core literary form that continues to be popular. But again, they weren't starting from scratch. They were building on a foundation already sort of provided by Irving and some other earlier writers that we don't have to worry about. But Irving's important in that regard as well. Uh, so that's pretty much all I needed to say, I think, about... Yeah, his background. Let's just jump into the story. Again, some of you may have read this before. I assume most of us have encountered the narrative in some shape or form. But again, I want us to think about geography here. I really want us to be focused on setting and regional characteristics because... Uh, Knickerbocker or Crayon or whoever the hell is supposed to be telling us this story, they're obviously very invested and in convincing us, convincing the readers that this is kind of the land that time forgot, right? This is an old Dutch enclave that's kind of been left untouched by progress and modernization. But again, there's that suggestion that it's not going to be untouched forever. So, like these other writers, we've already covered this, uh, Irving is invested in what we call historicizing 
the U.S. Really investing in a unique colonial history, an early national history, really interested in these earlier periods of American history. Because again, this is a generation that's already getting a little bit nostalgic for old colonial times, old bygone eras from the 1600s, from the 1700s, because we're rapidly moving away from those days. We're becoming a new place with new people, with a new culture. So there is this attempt to preserve history, and we always see this as history, as certain parts of history or certain parts of culture are falling away or fading away or getting erased, getting assimilated, there is this effort to kind of preserve certain aspects of it so we can always appreciate it, so we can always understand it. So notice how specific we're getting here with a lot of place names, a lot of geographical locations along the Hudson River, you know, the Tappan Zee, Terrytown, which is a real place, all of these old uh, Dutch settlements of New York, but also a very specific revolutionary history rooted in real history, real events that took place in that area. So the Headless Horseman, right? The origins of the Headless Horseman. He's supposed to have been an, a, a Hessian trooper, a Hessian soldier uh, uh, decapitated during one of these battles during the revolution that was fought nearby. And, the, and this is, again, kind of rooted in real events. The, the Hessians were actually German soldiers, sort of mercenaries, who were fighting on the side of the British, during the American Revolution. And these old Dutch uh, settlers, the, 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 or the descendants of the original Dutch settlers in New York, they largely fought on the side of the colonists, the other colonists who were rebelling against the British. So this is the way, and we can always observe this with different immigrant groups, but this is the way that the New York Dutch began, one of the ways that they began to kind of get assimilated into a larger American culture. They fought alongside a lot of English descended colonists in the revolution. They were fighting for the same cause, fighting for freedom. Um, and as time passed, you know, the language goes away. Some of their other unique aspects of culture might start to get forgotten, whether it be religious practices, food, clothes, music, dialect, or accents. Again, the first thing that goes is the language. More and more people speak English. And then maybe, you know, they even lose some other, you know, unique aspects of the way they speak. Uh, or certain dialects that are unique to the area. Again, we can see this happening even now. This is a development that people write about. Uh, Americans don't have as sharply defined accents anymore. Uh, it used to be you could tell where somebody was from just by listening to them talk, but now we move around a lot. You know, I'm from the South. A lot of people don't think I have a Southern accent. I would argue that if you're really listening for it, you can catch it sometimes. It comes and goes, um, but I've lived outside of the South also for a number of years. So, you know, I'm sure I, I know I don't sound like my parents. I don't sound like a lot of people, a lot of my older relatives who have lived there their entire lives. So again, these are currents in American life that we can still detect. The tension between rural and urban, that's still very much with us, I would argue. That's still with us in the, in the modern day. Uh, the question of progress versus tradition, that's still a conflict that we can see uh, today, you know, and this idea of, if, you know, progress is good oftentimes, but is it good if it obliterates local customs, older traditions, if it, you know, changes the nature of community? Is it still good? Is it always good? Um, or are there limits? These are some of the things that Irving wants to explore because they're all very relevant during his time in the 1820s, but like I said, I would argue that they're still relevant today as well. So he's giving us this idyllic sort of pastoral depiction of an old way of life, uh, old Dutch New York, these little nooks of still water. And he wants to tell us, right, that this is a place where superstitions, legends, mythology, they can really flourish because they're kind of isolated. They're a little bit separate from modern American life. So we have a different sort of set of beliefs here. 
But while he's celebrating that, while he's celebrating the local folklore, he's also kind of having fun with it. He's showing it to be, of course, not strictly true. We might argue that it doesn't have to be true. He's certainly acknowledging the cultural importance of folklore and sort of local legends and 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 the, and the stories that we tell um, that are sort of based on our home, our region, our history. Yeah, he celebrates it. He thinks it's fun, but he's also maybe gently mocking it at times. Uh, we can maybe look for that. Um, but yeah, this is a place, Sleepy Hollow, that's very conducive, as he says, to dreams and apparitions. So we notice that. And then Ichabod, so if, if Sleepy Hollow represents an older America, an older colonial past, that's not even English, right? It's a different group of people, a different history. It's an older tradition. If Sleepy Hollow represents all of that, Ichabod Crane represents the rapidly modernizing America, the new America, uh, you know, what we are turning into. It's important to notice that Ichabod is not a native of the area. I think he's from New England, right? He's supposed to be from Connecticut, maybe, and he has moved down here for work. Uh, he's a schoolmaster, a pedagogue, uh, a teacher. Doesn't maybe seem to love the work, but that is what he's doing at the present moment. Um, so he's an outsider. He doesn't share this unique Dutch heritage. But we should also notice some other things about Ichabod. Yes, he has a funny physical appearance. We are often invited to laugh at him, and that's fine. You can laugh at him. But also notice what he represents. Notice some of the ways that he's described. Uh, he's very acquisitive. He wants to acquire things. We might even say maybe a little bit selfish. Certainly enterprising, maybe quintessentially American. He wants to improve his station. I want you to notice how the narrator describes him at times. We know that he's courting Katrina uh, in part maybe because of her looks. She comes from a very old, distinguished Dutch family in the area. But he also seems interested in her family's money. She's, she comes from a wealthy family. So he wants to improve his station. He wants to come into some money. And at one point, the narrator even says that he would like to maybe buy, Ichabod would like to buy some land, maybe in Kentucky or Tennessee, some of these newer states as expansion continued. In the early 1800s, we start to push west, away from the Atlantic seaboard. We start pushing inland. So there's all this new land opening up. Again, new land to white people, stolen land uh, in the eyes of the Native Americans. But to, to people like Ichabod, there's a lot of opportunity in new states like Kentucky, Tennessee, where white people can come and acquire land pretty easily and they can start a new business or they can, you know, create a profitable farm or a plantation. And yes, if they were in Kentucky or Tennessee during that period, they would have likely been using slave labor to profit. But there was a lot of money to be made for people like him. So he's very interested in that. Uh, he's very interested in acquisition and improving his own uh, situation, which, again, is pretty typical American sort of qualities, right? He wants to succeed. He kind of has an entrepreneurial spirit, perhaps. At least he is enterprising. He's ambitious to a certain extent. So we're invited to laugh at him. But I think he represents a lot of important things about American life. And again, they're not all necessarily negative traits, but I think we're, we're, you know, we should notice how, they, how some of those traits come into conflict with a more traditional, a more agrarian, rural way of life. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to place a lot of value judgments or decide, okay, this way is right and that way is wrong. But there is a sense that Ichabod and people like Ichabod are going to sort of consume all of the sleepy hollows. They're going, you know, their spirit, their mentality 
of more. Let's let's acquire more. Let's settle more areas. Let's you know let's make money. These kinds of approaches and mentalities they don't really jive with the old traditions of a place like Dutch New York. So as a result, Ichabod doesn't quite fit in all that well. Again, he is an outsider, um, but. I also want to jump to the end of the text. I have a printout here, but I've somehow managed to already get get it out of order. But I just want to notice, I'm not going to walk you through the whole ghost story. You guys can figure it out. And you can see, again, Irving does this a lot. He creates a little folklore or retells it, if, if we're to believe that these stories have existed for a long time. And probably versions of them did. But again, Diedrich Knickerbocker is not a real person, nor is Jeffrey Crayon. But, you know, Irving gets a lot of mileage out of the folklore of the region, but then he sort of reveals it as being maybe a little, well, just not real. He just shows that it's all kind of a prank or it's all kind of a put on. And we have to decide how we feel about that. So... Ichabod leaves town after sort of being humiliated by Brom and the local Dutch boys. Again, he doesn't quite fit in, so he becomes the object or the subject of ridicule. Um, so that is kind of noteworthy, but he leaves, right? Um, and a lot of the local townspeople just assume that the, that the headless horseman, you know, the galloping Hessian must have gotten him, and he's never coming back. But we, the readers, learn what Ichabod actually goes on to do. So I hope I'm not giving, you know, giving anything away here. Spoiler alert. But I want to jump to the end. And let's learn what's next for this ambitious, acquisitive guy. Uh, so later we learn uh, that Ichabod Crane was still alive. Uh, that he had left partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress, Katrina. Uh, but also, you know, he's humiliated by the guys, whatever. So he goes on and he keeps school, uh, studies law at the same time. Uh, he, he is later admitted to the bar, which means he becomes a lawyer. He's then turned politician, okay? He electioneered, he wrote for newspapers, and finally he had been made a justice of the 10-pound court. <laughs> the 10-pound court was just sort of a, a way to recover small debts and like justices of the peace, were essentially allowed to rule on cases that involved like very small amounts of money. Uh, so it's just, it's like a, it's part of the legal profession. It's a type of kind of low ranking judge. But just notice all the different things that he does, right? Uh, he, he's once again involved in education. He becomes a lawyer. He becomes a judge. He becomes a politician. He becomes a journalist. Um, so, Again, this is true to the character, right? He wants more. He's doing a lot of different things. He's trying his hand at a lot of different businesses, right? Uh, he's making money. He's going to new places. That's America during this period of rapid change, right? America's kind of restless. We, we don't, many of us, you know, it, certainly back then, but maybe we would argue even now, we don't want to stay in one place for very long. We're always moving to new places, starting new careers, making new lives. So that's Ichabod, right? That, that, that's kind of what Ichabod represents. And then meanwhile, Brom and Katrina, you know, get married and all evidence suggests that they just stay uh, and continue that sort of traditional way of life in this particular region. So we're supposed to see the contrast here between uh, American progress represented by Ichabod. It's restless. It's maybe a little bit acquisitive, very much focused on consumption, but also ambitious doing a lot of new things, breaking new ground. And then we have the old traditions where they don't really want to change, but maybe they, maybe eventually they'll have to. Uh, how long can they stay separate from the main currents of American life? So that's, that's a tension that Irving is interested in. He wants us to kind of reflect on it as well. But we're also supposed to just enjoy the local folklore, especially as we realize that 
those old days are gone. A lot of those old customs and traditions are gone, but they live on in literature. They live on in other types of art, and we can still appreciate them. Okay, so that's probably enough. Oh, yeah, and just, again, note, if you're thinking about Ichabod, notice how much he likes to eat. That's also emphasized, right? He's a big feeder. He likes to eat because he's very much about acquisition and consumption. And again, we don't have to find fault with him necessarily, but his way of life is sort of incompatible with this old Dutch New York way of life. So again, kind of a story that we hear and see a lot in America. Uh, It's the story of immigration in a lot of ways. It's the story of what happens to immigrant groups after they've been here for a while, right? So in time, yeah, they largely get assimilated into the mainstream of American life. So they adopt English, right? They adopt other customs and cultures that are different from their native ones, right? This happens with a lot of different groups. We still see it happening with immigrant groups that are Uh, you know, still coming over more recent groups. It just so happens that the Dutch were one of the first immigrant groups to come over here. So we're watching this process play out with them a long time ago, but the same process plays out with other immigrant groups throughout American history. And there's always that tension, like how much do you want to assimilate? A certain amount of that is probably necessary, but then you also want to retain certain aspects of your native culture. How do you do that? How possible is that? And how do you resist certain aspects of the mainstream culture that might be incompatible with your culture? So it's a very American narrative. As a nation of immigrants, we've been telling this story in different forms for a long time. So Irving's engaged in that, but just notice he's doing some of the same things that our frontier romance authors are doing, but he's not writing frontier romances. He's writing sort of comedic short fiction, which is important in the history of short stories, but he's not an important novelist like Sedgwick and Cooper. So they're really advancing American lit. Irving's playing his part. His popularity helps to pave the way for future American writers like Hawthorne, Poe, and Melville, who would come to be celebrated overseas like Irving was. So he's an important figure. He he helps to set the stage for the American Renaissance, but so does Sedgwick and so does Cooper. So we've covered some of these important second generation figures. Now we're ready to get started on unit three, the American Renaissance. We start with Hawthorne and we'll talk about my kinsman, Major Molyneux, in part two.